Welcome to ACM. We're in Edinburgh, United Kingdom today, and our guest is Dr. Sinyan Lai. Sinyan is Taiwanese, born and raised in Taipei. After studying political science and Arabic in Taiwan, he moved to Scotland 12 years ago to obtain his PhD in politics from the University of Edinburgh. He is currently a member of the Foreign Policy Analysis Research Network in Edinburgh and teaches Middle Eastern International Relations at the University of St. Andrews. Sinyan is a proud father of two Scottish Taiwanese boys, and he's also a coach and an MVP player at the Tayport baseball team in Scotland. Yes, Scotland has baseball too. Sinyan and I had a truly enjoyable conversation. We discussed his journey from Taiwan to Scotland, geopolitical conflicts in the Middle East and East Asia, family and youth education, as well as homesickness. It was an honest, reflective, and thought-provoking episode, and I think you'll enjoy it. Sinyan, yes. welcome. Thank Thanks. you very Thanks much for, having me. For, for being here. So you brought a baseball glove, yes. and I feel that's a outfielder glove? I, slash yeah, utility kind of, pitcher yeah, as well? Yeah, utility. I made it for pitcher. Yeah, and then a letter. I think you need to get a little bit closer to the mic. Yeah, maybe. Here we go. There you go. Would you like to talk about the glove or the letter first? So the glove, uh, I have been using this glove since uh, 2004 uh, when I was uh, 30 undergrad. And uh, at that time, I was the, the captain of my uni team. So I bought a glove for me, and since then I've been using this for a long time. And uh, yeah, it's great. I, it, it, it's unbelievable that I can still use this glove in Scotland. Yeah. Can I can I do a, a test of how how broken in it is? It oh is my. really broken. It, it, it's kind it's of kind broken. of broken inside as well. Yeah. <laughs> Might need a little bit of Vaseline. Because <laughs> <laughs> this is what you've used to to pitch in Scotland as well. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So when I play shortstop, I use another one. Mm. So why? So what's the value in this glove? Obviously, apart from the the length in which length of period in which you've had this for and things like that. I think it's just like because uh, baseball is a huge part of my life, and then just like every boys uh, in 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 Taiwan, like we we are always dreaming, you know, be, being able to play in the professional league, and that was my dream. But as you know, like. You know, from Asian society, and uh, my my parents thought like, okay, this is now a promising career, so you're gonna be really, really poor at some point. <laughs> it's not a promising mm. career, so like, I gave up that kind of dream, and so and at that time I was kind of doing okay mm -hmm. academically, so they thought like, you know, since you you are doing okay academically, so you shouldn't just go to play baseball as your career mm -hmm. so i gave up that dream but like when i got into uh, the uni and uh, i got to play again i got to join the uni team so that's why i bought this as kind of you know, a new start because i resumed my quasi baseball career right and so ever since then and he just stays with me mm. yeah from taiwan and uh, actually from taipei to um, Jai, uh, which is a, a city in the south of Taiwan, okay. and when I was doing my master, I was also playing baseball down there. And after that, I came, went abroad. I came here to do my master by research and PhD, and I still play baseball. It's mm -hmm. great. Yeah. Just to give give uh, some level of context, we've we've actually met in a Scottish baseball league, league. in team. Uh, Last year when I got back from my military service, baseball has always been an important sport for me as well. I mm -hmm. played in Japan um, and yeah, I was throwing, you know, in, in, the, in the Marine Corps as well with my peers. Um, and yeah, I was looking for a baseball team. I just randomly searched. I think I was in Korea and I knew that I had to prepare <laughs> myself for like the new social uh, kind of getting myself back into the social scene after national service, and I found the Tayport Baseball Club in Scotland. Yeah, which was crazy because I didn't, didn't know Scotland <laughs> played baseball. Technically, we're the only league in Scotland, right? Yes, 
So if Scotland、uh, had wanted to make a national team to play at the the World Baseball Classics, for example, <laughs> you would probably be <laughs> one of the. I would probably be sitting on the bench <laughs> being <Okay> . cheerleaders. <laughs> really? <laughs> but but if Scotland had a team, then you would for sure be on the team, national team. I I don't know. Like <laughs> if if you if well say if like that's like you know ten years ago maybe that probably. Okay. You know, well, he's just being humble. He's an amazing、yeah. uh, baseball player. You pitch.、Um, I mean, you can do everything. You also coach.、Um, you were the MVP. I mean, you were MVP all the time, basically. No,、uh, <laughs> not really. But what did you play in Taiwan? What was your position? Ah,、uh, shortstop. Okay. Yes.、Ah. So I play shortstop a lot, and sometimes、uh, I pitch a bit, but mainly just for BP、mm. batting practice. And this is how I sort of train my arm and、uh, sort of you know practice my command.、Um, but most of the time, I was playing shortstop. Yeah. Where do you think the love of baseball come from in Taiwan? Obviously, it's probably an American influence.、Um, yeah. But is that like the national sport? I would say so. Yeah. Yeah, national sport. What other sports are popular in Taiwan? I think. Basketball, okay, yeah, football or soccer、um, mm. is not that popular. Yeah, I didn't see a single Taiwan game in the Asian <laughs> Football Club Cup. Speaking of, it's they're actually the the top eight right now. Semi, the quarterfinals is、yeah. happening right now. Yes,、uh, between South Korea and Australia. I saw the news. <laughs> yeah,、yes. so we'll, we'll find out. Good luck. Yeah. And then you have the letter.、Yes. Would you like to talk about the letter? Right, yeah, it would get me quite emotional. So the letter is、uh, actually was written by my mom, and、uh, so, and she handed this letter to me. I think the night before I took my flight、uh, to Edinburgh,、mm. so which is、uh, where you 20- went to your masters. Yes,、yeah. exactly. Uh, uh, the date was twenty、uh, eighth of August. Twenty twelve, it was like、uh, how many years ago? Twelve, eleven, twelve, something. Yeah. So she wrote this letter to me. I did not open this letter until I got on my plane.、Mm. So the minute I opened it and I read it,、yeah. I just couldn't help. Yeah. You came to Edinburgh by yourself initially. Yes, I ca- I came to Edinburgh by myself first, and then after six months. My wife came to came to join me because、mm. at that time I thought like it might be a good idea just for me, you know, settling everything down, and、uh, then she she could sort of join me later on. Because that was my f- actually that was my first time、um, living、mm-hmm. in a, in an English speaking country. Before that, I had never been to any、Bru- sort of、really? English speaking country. Wow! And Scotland was your first. Yes, an honor. it was. It, it was my honor too. It was absolute a culture shock. I remember, like you know, when I checked in the hostel, and the lady at the reception spoke.、Uh, and Edinburgh does not have a thick accent.、Uh, yes,、yeah. you're right. Yes, but at that time, I thought, oh, oh my goodness, like、uh, she has got quite a thick、uh, Scottish accent, and、uh, I could. Barely understand any anything she said to me, so I, I only the only thing I can re- I can remember is like I kept saying like, pardon, pardon, sorry, <laughs> yeah. So after checking, I was in my room and I was asking myself, what the heck I'm doing here? I couldn't understand anything,、yeah. and then now I'm going. I was so naive, and I thought like, I'm gonna do my PhD. How, you no, know, how is that possible? Like. Yeah, so it was a cultural shock, but yeah. So the letter was from my mom.、Yeah. Do you want to read、uh, the letter in in Mandarin as it's written, even just a portion of it? Yeah,、uh, it's not very long, so I can、mm. sort of read it in Mandarin first. So, so the letter says, 儿子，现在的你已踏上前往你人生梦想的第一步。我与爸皆以你为荣为傲。诚如你所说，人生的路是自己选决定与选择，也因为你的坚持、叛逆，让我与你爸不得不折服。但这仅仅是开始，往后还有很长的艰辛路。博士
是非常不简单的成就，但我与爸绝对有信心，你一定会做到。你要好好专心，你的课业往前冲，家里的一切你不用担心。你老妈我一定会把她经营的好好的，等你们回来接棒，请务必。注意你的身体，这才是我们担心的。在此，我与爸祝福你飞向梦想的另一端，永远爱你的爸与妈。And at the end, they say like， 对不起，呃，让你背负那么沉重的使命。二零一二八月二十八。Yeah. So basically, like, I'll do a bit of translation of this. And、um, so, what my mom says, like, now you, you are taking the first step toward your your dream, and, uh. uh Your dad and myself are so proud of you. And as you said,、uh, this is your choice. You know,、uh, it's just bec- because of your、uh, persistence. And、uh, um, so my 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 so myself and my and your dad is is or、well, have to have to so commend this. But it's just only the beginning. There's a long way to go, a tough road to go. You know, taking a Doing a PhD is not easy. And it's gonna be, on it's gonna be a big achievement for you, and we are both、uh, very confident in you. And you would do that. You would do really well. And just be focused on your study, and、uh, don't worry about everything at home. And、uh, I will take care of everything until you get back. And、uh, so stay stay healthy. And this is what, you know, that's basically what every parent、mm. is worried about, like this. So they are worried about my health and whether you're eating well,、right? <laughs> exactly. Asian、yes. culture. So,、uh, best of luck, and、uh, so love you, dad and mom. And at the end, they say like, sorry、uh, for letting you、uh, to take to carry this heavy role and heavy responsibility because I'm the. The oldest son in my family, because you know, like、mm-hmm. the oldest son always takes that kind of big responsibility in the family. Yep. I only caught a few words because I did study a little bit of Mandarin. Really, I learned a little bit of Chinese. Oh, in the United States, in in America, um, but just the yeah, just the context of it and the way. You wrote, you read it. it. Got me emotional as well. Thinking about, I, I, I don't know when that click was for me when I left home because I just sort of moved around and、mm. it was a more of a flowy transition rather than like a hard kind of, you know, stop and go. Yeah.、Um, what was the dream that you mentioned that your parents mentioned the letter that you were chasing? What brought you to Scotland? Yeah. So, I actually never thought. One day I will be able to study abroad, like because、uh, I know it would cost a lot of money, and、uh, and also I'm the oldest son、uh, in my family. I think I need to take care of that kind of you know the family also need to take that kind of responsibility, staying around my parents.、Mm. So I didn't think about that until I was doing my first master in Taiwan. And then one of my professors、uh, sort of ran into. So that was a kind of graduate. That was graduation day. So I invited my mom and dad to attend my graduation ceremony, and、uh, I took them around to, to visit the the campus. So we ran into one of my professors、mm-hmm. who really likes me. <laughs> so he said to my my parents that like,、uh, if possible, like you should think about the possibility of you know. Getting Xinyan、mm. uh, to study abroad, I think he has got that kind of talent. And were you studying international relations then? Yes, I was doing a、uh, political science and、uh, with a major in international relations. Okay. So he he kind of you know highly suggested.、Um, so from then, like my parents thought about that and they really took it really seriously, you know. Mm. So that's kind of my dream, and、uh, so I said to them, like, yeah, I would like to give a shot, yeah, and see if I could be sort of studying abroad,、uh, basically pursuing a PhD, yeah. You talked about the language kind of being the one of the factors of culture shock. Yeah. What else shocked you when you when you came to Europe, Scotland in particular? 
many things I would say.、Um, the 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 cradle culture shock mainly came from you know, some of my re- reflection on that kind of misunderstanding or rosy image about the UK.、Mm. You know, what was so, the image of the UK? So basically, like you know, people thought like that. I'm not quite sure if that's in Korea, but、uh, in Taiwan, people just thought like, okay, yeah, every everyone speaks like you know BBC reporter, you know, having、English. that kind of RP accent. <laughs> so, but when I got to Scotland, it, it's not、mm. uh, right. It's, it's not, you know, and also not everyone is having afternoon tea. <laughs> <laughs> and tea is actually better in Asia, <laughs> surprisingly. <laughs> here, here, yeah, here, here. <laughs> Yeah, so and it got me to think like, well, like if this is kind of the sort of misunderstanding we've got、uh, in 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 Taiwan, perhaps in in Asia, like we always have that kind of rosy image about like,、mm. okay, this is the West, the progress progressive West,、mm-hmm. but actually it's not right. Now we have different, you know.、Um, Like people just working in different industry sectors, you know. So not not everyone、mm. is being able to <laughs> have an afternoon tea. That's right. Or going to like、uh, what's it called Waitrose. Waitrose. Yeah. No. Or the, the going to watch the Wimbledon game and all lights. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, not that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And did you know that Scotland was different from England? I. To be honest, almost like, an independent state. <laughs> I was ignorant.、Mm. <laughs> I was ignorant, like before coming to Scotland. I heard about Edinburgh because my、uh, my wife's aunt、mm-hmm. uh, used to study in Edinburgh for、okay. a period of time. So this is what I heard about Edinburgh. But apart from that, I did, didn't know Edinburgh.、Mm. So yeah. But looking back, it's a it's a Totally a blessing、mm. uh, coming here. Yeah, I think to me because I was coming from the states. Yes. So I was in Korea until I was twelve, and then I moved to Japan. I stay. I was in Tokyo. Tokyo was my home for ten years. But out of those ten years, I also was in America for boarding school. And then after graduating from my my high school in the states, I came straight to Scotland. And to me, Scotland was like a magical place. You know the Harry Potter land. Oh,、uh, true. And I, I just watched the, you know the, the William the, the you know, the, Braveheart. Yeah, yeah, Braveheart. <laughs> Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson, who does not have the the best Scottish accent either, but、no. to me that was like the image of Scotland, just blue and kind of magical and Harry Pottery. And it's true. It's quite true to a large extent.、Um, yeah. But sometimes, and maybe this might have to be off the record. There's a fine line between a magical Harry Potter land and a dark dungeon.、Mm, <laughs> I, I see what I mean. Yeah, yeah. It depends. If you're coming to visit, you know, it's like that's the Harry Potter is what you're gonna get. Even if it's dark and gloomy, there is magic to that, and there is still magic to it. But sometimes,、uh, you know, when you're not well.、Um, And you know you feel lonely and and things like that. You can the the beautiful Harry Potter land can also feel like、uh, a dungeon to you. But I think that's anywhere you go. True. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I would say that even in Tokyo it could be like this gr- bright neon sign kind of futuristic city. On the other hand, you could just feel like, you know, you're sort of in in the dark in the sort of the underground of busy bustling city does not care about you. You know so. It、mm. it can go either way, I think. True, yeah. So in Saint Andrews, yes, your studies and teachings are primarily focused on Middle Eastern relations, geopolitics. Yeah. Why, why did you want to get into that specifically? Right. Yeah. And、uh, so when I was in Taiwan, my undergrad major was was、uh, Arabic. Hmm. <laughs> Really? So I went to、uh, Chengdu University, <clears throat> which is the the only、uh, university in Taiwan back then,、mm-hmm. the only university in Taiwan teaching Arabic. So I got into that department, and to be honest, like I was not doing really well. I was not a good student. 
I was not very diligent. I spent much of my time, unit time, in the baseball field, <laughs> so I was not doing really well. But I still got some kind of really basic, you know, language ability. But at the time,、uh, I was always wanting to do some study and research about、uh, international politics.、Mm-hmm. So when I finished my undergrad, I kind of shifted my study focus. So then I, that's why I went to like Jai to do a, a master in political science with a major in international relations. At that time, I thought like, yeah, I could be a kind of Bridge, you、mm. know, between like Middle Eastern studies in Taiwan and also international relations in Taiwan.、Um, I have to say, we've got so many brilliant scholars and experts,、mm-hmm. you know, studying and researching the Middle East. Whether it's about its, you know, culture, language, history, and and certainly we have a, a lot of brilliant IR scholars in Taiwan, but many of them are working on cross-strait relations. Taiwan, Japan, and even Korea, and、uh, not m- many of them、mm-hmm. are interested in like Middle Eastern politics. And、um, so, MB politics is kind of really marginalized subject in Taiwan. So at、mm-hmm. that time, again, I was kind of naive. I think I thought like, yeah, that might be a good idea for me to play this role, bridging the two disciplines. So I think that's the the kind of the, the initial. Thought I I got, and、um, that's why I kind of I、like、combine my language ability and kind of area studies knowledge with a discipline which is IR.、Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then for when you did your PhD in Edinburgh, yeah,、uh, what did you focus on? What were your What was your main curiosity? My main curiosity was about like so we've got、uh, many. Um, Middle East states, right? And、uh, but the mainstream understanding of the Middle East,、uh, I think I would say like across the the globe, is always really sort of what we call Orientalist is based on kind of Orientalist understanding, which meaning meaning like there's always kind of Eurocentric view、mm-hmm. of how and why the Middle East、mm-hmm. as a region looks like. So I was I got into that kind of you know、uh, discussion and、uh, so I was reading like quite a lot of stuff about like politics of the Middle East and how like the Middle East came into being a region in the scholarship in our understanding and I found like there's a sub region、uh, called、uh, the Persian Gulf some people call it the Arabian Gulf which is quite unique to me、mm-hmm. because、uh, they are all like monarchies.、Mm. And so, politic wi- politics wise, you can say they are more or less kind of conservative,、mm. right? It's not very sort of democratic, but at the same time, they have made such a economic miracle、mm. at the international stage. So I was really interested in that. How does that happen? Because in in the past. We were told like you know Taiwan and Korea、mm. are the two、Asian、perfect、tigers. exactly yeah Taiwan and Korea made economic miracle and which is also related to to the whole dynamics of democratization political liberalization but it did it didn't happen in in the Gulf、mm. so I was I was really interested in that so、mm-hmm. was, why this kind of you know、uh, this kind of economic miracle did not lead to Like you know, political liberalization、mm. and even democratization in this region. So there must must be something that you know we we need to sort of explain.、Mm-hmm. And then for that, um, I got really interested in knowing their history, political、mm. history per se. What、yeah. have you found from that? And when you've devoted the years to doing research、mm-hmm. based on that curiosity, what what have you found? There's so many factors that、mm. we can sort of, like in academic sense, we we can you know use that kind of different factors to explain.、Sure. But I think it's just about you know the, the progress, the whole kind of progress. So if say like as we just said, as we just talk about the the 
the Taiwan experience or Korean experience, right? And uh, and that is some understanding within like the tradition of Western liberalism believes that you know once we have that kind of economic liberalization, that will kick off the whole process process of political liberalization. But it doesn't happen. And I think it's that kind of understanding is based on or derives from the Western experience, mm. very Eurocentric or you can you can say U.S. centric experience. And but it didn't happen. So and I thought like there must be something, not something wrong, but something mm. that we haven't been able to explain. Mm. So I thought like you know by looking into the history, I think there is a huge part of the the political history in the Gulf that has been overlooked for a long time, which is the the connection between the civil society and their government, which is the kind of regime. So and. Uh, Many people believe that all these kind of you no know, political political liberalization process should be led by, I mean, at least in Taiwan and Korea, mm. you know, it was mainly led by the government, mm-hmm. etc. And um, but it, it actually, I would say like it, it did not happen in the the reason why it did not happen in in the Gulf is because like we we never take we never taken that kind of civil the role of civil society into account. So I think that's why, like, there is a lack of understanding. Um, but in terms of what that did not happen, I think I'm I'm still looking for that answer. Sure. So I, I I can't. Sorry, I cannot yeah. give you. No. Why do you think that Korea and Taiwan, in particular, were able to achieve the economic miracle? Well, uh, <laughs> I do believe, like, geopolitical, like. There is a geopolitical reason. Um, uh, I think I have to say, like whether you like like it or not, the the United States play a huge role mm-hmm. in the post uh, World War Two uh, Asian mm-hmm. international order. So, which mean like they they play a kind of hegemonic role in mm-hmm. stabilizing the regional order, and under that kind of within that kind of context, I think I'm not quite sure if. If Korean government was sort of aided by the United States at yeah, the time, yeah, hugely, yeah, hugely, so, same as the ROC government in Taiwan. So I think that would, the United States play a big role mm-hmm. there. Yeah, and then you know once that once, st- you know, having that kind of political stability, mm-hmm. I think they do have sort of energy and time and resources putting into investing into like. A, Economic development, and also that you now coming, that would speak to something I said just now. You know, if we have that kind of, you know, in in at the regional level, if there was a kind of political stability, like like those countries, which are like U.S. Uh, allies, they mm. could concentrate on stabilizing their domestic politics, economic development. So I think that you know U.S. Does play a, did play a role and still? Do you think the fact that Taiwan and South Korea don't really have any natural resources, um, and therefore we had to rely on technological development initially, obviously starting with cheap labor, and then we yeah. built our economy that way. Koreans had we had, uh, you know, tens of thousands of Koreans, hundreds of thousands of Koreans going to Europe, for example, to Germany to work in these mines and bringing back foreign currency and things mm. like this, and then ultimately. Um, you know, just to give you an example, like my uh, my great grandfather, so my mother's grandfather, he was the founder of the shipbuilding industry in Korea, mm-hmm. and the way he started the shipbuilding sort of phenomenon in Korea, which is now the number one you know industry in the world, maybe now surpassed by China because Hanjin <laughs> has just gone bankrupt. Um, he, my great grandfather. F- Started well, built the first ship of Korea and traded with the United States with a Korean, the Republic of Korea flag, for the first time in history of Korea as a nation. Wow. And so, uh, and he did that by uh, basically uh, salvaging, resalvaging the uh, a sunken Korean, a Japanese ship, a cargo ship, hmm. in in the Korean waters. And he basically studied it, he dissected it, he rebuilt it, 
and that was the first ship of Korea called Korea, which is Korea comes from. Oh. Uh, yeah, Korea comes from the name Korea, which was before the Joseon Dynasty, and so that's how he started the industry in Korea. Was he basically repurposed a sunken Japanese ship, and then ended up becoming, you know, building a corporation that was the most successful, you know. Asian, or in general, one of the most successful um, shipbuilding um, companies in the world, and now therefore Korea has as uh, one of the top. It is the top shipbuilder in the world. Um, obviously, not until China, uh, but uh, that's the same story with a lot of Korean corporations too. So Samsung, mm. LG. Yeah, uh, I know that a lot of these companies were OEM. So second party, uh, third party manufacturers for Japan because of their cheap labor, and what we did was we got a bit of technology, um, you know, uh, under the table from the Japanese managers and technologists, uh, and we were able to then start manufacturing our own uh, products. And uh, for example, with TV, you know, we have the yes. the, the most. Uh, <laughs> most uh, technologically advanced uh, TVs in the world, for example, uh, Samsung, LG, and so on. And, and all of those parts and the, the lineage can, you can trace back to when, when they were manufacturing uh, Japanese yeah. TVs, for example. And obviously that you know, goes back to the Germans or the Americans and so on. But, so that, that's, that was sort of the, uh, the initial kind of the spurring of the industrial moment for, I think, Korea. Mm. Um, we were able to learn and copy a little bit and then yeah. perfect it and make it even you know more advanced uh you know beyond um beyond what was present so yeah i guess i'm curious about taiwan uh, i would say like uh first of all I, i'm not like particularly working in sure. like, taiwanese political economy but as far as i know i think that that's kind of general understanding that taiwan has gone through quite if not identical, quite similar mm. uh, political also economic trajectory over the past decades uh, after World War Two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and that's why I think still now, like some Taiwanese people, well, at least like until um, until the point I left Taiwan, like I think like many people still took uh, maybe maybe now still take Korea as the the competitor. Taiwan does, <laughs> yeah, in many <laughs> industry, especially you know, mm. IT and whatever. And we have the pressure, and Taiwan and Korea both have the pressure from the the close neighbors, right? Yes. And so there's always that. There's a terminology called the Korea discount. So when oh. foreign investors look into investing in Korea as a country, then they will always apply a Korea discount because of the fact that we are unstable geopolitically because of our neighbors in the north. Oh. So that's called the Korea discount. Korean and discount. definitely Taiwan has a discount to some extent too. Taiwan discount. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Taiwan> discount. Maybe. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. So then let's maybe discuss Taiwan and uh, and East Asian relations at large, uh, if if we may. Yeah, just, sure. Just wanted to get your thoughts. Yeah. Do you think there's a problem in... Uh, there? There is a... Uh, an inherent problem between Taiwan and China is there a, and if there is, uh, is there a true resolution to the Taiwan-China conflict? That's a really big question. I know. Uh, I think everyone wants to know. I know. Um, so say like, how bad is the conflict, and whether there will be any war between Taiwan and China. I think for Taiwanese people, you know, um, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say this on behalf of my fellow sure. Taiwanese, but like, you know, based on my humble opinion, I think no one would deny or no one would disagree that we have to talk to China or we have to have some kind of platform on which we can sort of share some ideas, exchange some ideas to prevent a war, mm. not just only between Taiwan and, and China, but also the war in East Asia. Yeah, I think having that kind of peace is, 
I would say it's a kind of you know, common goal and consensus.、Mm. And I do believe, like over the past few years, eight years, and now there will be another term、uh, led by DPP,、uh, Democratic Progress Party in Taiwan. They just got elected、yeah. as a president. I think during during the Tsai Ing-wen's administration, I think she did send a clear message to the Chinese government that no, it's fine. We we need to talk. Yeah. But the point is that we they have to respect、mm-hmm. the Taiwanese political will because、mm-hmm. because we are democ democratic country,、mm-hmm. you know, and then any anyone who is holding the power, being a president.、Mm-hmm. They have to respect. They have to listen to Taiwanese people's political will. Yeah, and I believe this is the the biggest difference、uh, between Taiwan and China. You know, so you shouldn't be only decided by only one person.、Mm. It has to go through like a democratic process. Right. Yeah. Whatever the outcome may be, war is not an option. In East Asia, no, I don't think anyone. There's too much at stake. Yeah, way too much. But having said that, because I, we know,、um, the Chinese government has never sort of given up the idea to sort of use the the force to what they call li- liberate <laughs> Taiwan. So in that kind of you know. On that kind of condition,、mm. like we we have to prepare ourselves. Yeah. Anyway, it's kind、Do、of the think, dilemma. <laughs> well,、uh, historically speaking, Russia has not been afraid of kinetic alteration altercations. China, we haven't really seen、uh, an explicit example of that.、Mm. So I hope that you know. They do shy away and are very cautious of any real militaristic altercations、mm-hmm. in the region.、Um, do you really think China would be willing to go to war for for Taiwan? Tough.、Um, I'm not sure. Like at least I I don't think that would happen in. At least in th- this year.、Um, <laughs> Hope not. <laughs> What do you mean this year? Because I don't know. Like I, I would not rule out、mm. uh, their intention to sort of、uh, launch a war with Taiwan. I would not rule out that kind of option. Then nationally in Taiwan, for Taiwan citizens, if they had a choice. And maybe again, this might have to be off the record. Is a、uh, between defending the country militaristically to fight for the democratic freedom, freedom,、mm. versus conforming to a new kind of Chinese rule that might undermine the way in which the citizens of Taiwan live and go about their day to day. Now, what do you think? An average Taiwanese person would choose. I am pretty confident that most people would go with the, the first option. Really, wow! Because, well, if you if we discuss this topic or question like maybe five years ago,、mm. or maybe longer, long before, we could have got a quite different、uh, answer. But now, I do believe like. Many Taiwanese people like、uh, would like to fight for what we have now、mm. in terms of the value, in terms of the ways of living, in terms of、e- everything. Yes, I know there are some people who who might argue that you know we both speak Mandarin Chinese, right? Our ancestors、you、came from yeah. But now, like, we are having a different system, having a different way of living. And、uh, and we, I I think most people will would like to sort of fight for that. Yeah. What do you think has changed in the past five years? 
Hong Kong. What's happening in Hong mm. Kong? Yeah. So one day, one day, two system doesn't work out in Hong Kong,、mm. right? We have seen that、uh, since even before 2019, right? And、uh, it doesn't give any. I'm pretty sure it doesn't get give any hope.、Uh, to so it's all or nothing. Yeah, kind of, and、uh, sooner, sooner or later. So that's I think because the it's kind of heavy. So I'm just gonna tilt it up. Yeah. So what's happening in Hong Kong does、uh, send a message to or signaling a message to to to, to most Taiwanese people. And it basically, like that kind of second option, as you just said, just, just doesn't convince anyone.、Mm. Anyone I know, you know. I was in, so I served in the Marine Corps in Korea, and I did a、um, a combined exercise in the Philippines called the Kamandag exercise in 2022.、Uh, it was a Sort of a trilateral exercise between well, actually four countries involved:、uh, United States, mainly、mm. United States Marine Corps, South、uh, Republic of Korea Marine Corps,、uh, the Philippines Marines, and Japanese Self Defense Force, and their sort of maritime unit.、Uh, that was a very interesting experience.、Uh, first, because they say that the exercise is for the purpose of humanitarian assistance, but. <laughs> Obviously, you don't. You know, you don't really need an osprey full of infantry marines jumping, you know, out of the the sky for humanitarian assistance.、Um, and yeah, obviously, that exercise was for the potential conflict rising in in Taiwan between Taiwan and China.、Mm-hmm. And what what a lot of the Marine Corps commanders in the the United States Marine Corps commanders that I've spoken to. Told me was that a lot of、um, uh, a lot of generals and colonels、um, and marines that have experience in the Middle East are being relocated to the divisions that are responsible for、um, for East Asia operations in the East Asia region,、mm. which obviously that you know that kind of explains why you know it, it's self-explanatory.、Mm. And、um, yeah,、uh, that just scare. That just sounds extremely scary to me. If because there, I mean, obviously we have North Korea too, right there. Yes, which is,、um, and I'm obviously not an expert, so I can't really say. But I'm sure that they can't really act on their own without any,、uh, without a, without permission from China. <laughs> For example, if they wanted to wage war, a war against South Korea, then I don't think that they can do that without Chinese support. Yeah.、Uh, so they're just—it's a complex.、Um, it's a very complex geopolitical situation with a very complex history.、And、I mean, that was really the first stage of Cold War in a way as well,、right? True, between、yes. South and North Korea. Yeah. And people forget about that. It's like the Forgotten War. Um. So all the more dangerous, and I mean, we've come a long way, South Korea as a country, to build the society that we have today.、Mm. It's really <sighs> impressive, and obviously we want to defend that. Um, you know, even if that means bearing arms, and you know, obviously that's what we do. We, we every South Korean male has to serve in the military, but also. War means a destruction of everything that we know today.、Mm. So, yeah, I mean, I, I I feel like, and after I've served in the Marines,、uh, I feel like you have to prepare for the worst. The military has to prepare for the worst situation possible. Maybe the government has to、uh, aim for the best possible scenario. Yeah.、Um, and if you're talking, then you're not fighting, but you always have to be prepared for the worst in terms of military. Um, yeah, I agree. Like I think, like any state leaders、uh, don't want to participate in war, but、mm-hmm. they got to prepare for that. As you said, they got to prepare for the worst. And、uh, and any state leaders would like to 
resolve any issues and conflict via like diplomatic means. So you know, launching a war using that kind of you know, military means mm. is the last resort. The thing is, um, and there's a saying, wars are um, uh, fought by people, young people that don't know each other for old people that know each other. And, you know, that, that's the part that that is upsetting is, yes, you are fighting to protect your country, but at the same time, you know, the, the decisions and the conflicts are being um, the decisions are being made and the conflicts are happening at, at a higher level in which you have no idea, no clue of. Uh, mm. So, True. And uh, speaking of that, I knew like in the past few years doing the Tsai Ing-wen's administration, there are quite a lot of criticisms about her leadership. Mm. Uh, so basically just say like they, they are sort of warmonger. Like mm. they use that kind of you know scenario of launching a war or yeah. having a war between tai Taiwan and China to get popularity, mm. but I think that's not very true. Um, because again, like she was elected president, right? And Taiwan is a democratic society, and uh, as I just as I just said, like any state leader should represent the Taiwan people's political will. Mm-hmm. So it's not like you know that kind of idea or, or threatening people that there might be a war we got to prepare. It, it's it's not from her mm. herself. I think like people do have that kind of sense that you know before the Chinese government gave up the idea or get gave up that thought of you know having a war or. or or liberating what they call liberated mm. Taiwan, then we got to prepare for that. Yeah. So I would say that's kind of you know a, a sort of a sum up of Taiwan's people's political will. Mm. So it's not necessarily like you know Taiwan Taiwanese people was were kind of manipulated by the president. I don't think so. Mm. Yeah. How's the tea, by the way? It's great. It's yeah. great. Yeah, yeah, it's good. <laughs> so I either initially I wanted to start every podcast episode with a different kind of Asian tea. Oh, and nice. You kind of talk about it, and you kind of pair with it. So I would try to get sort of gauge what sort of color and you know flavor and the aroma you would be as a person or your story, uh. and then try to introduce a new tea. Something maybe even something that I've never uh, had before. Maybe we'll do that. But then this item thing I thought was really good. Um, so we started with that. But maybe we should also pair the conversations with Asian tea. Then this makes it, you know, yeah. like the best of everything we have to offer, you know. Yeah, I tea, feel like tea food, is, yes. Yeah, tea is, yeah, so, so precious. Yeah. And I feel like it's under, under branded. The experience of tea, Asian tea is under branded. Mm. If you look at like the famous tea house, tea brands, the La Marayage, the mm. you know the the French one, which is like yep. the colonial kind of thing, uh, the colonial tea experience, which you know, which is actually quite nice, <laughs> but it's just not. That's not how we want a story. It's not the only way in which we want to story tell Asian tea. And then you got TWG, which is basically like the same thing. Yeah, and it's Singaporean, but it's also colonial. You know. Yes. Uh, so I think, yeah, maybe Kumbini should have its uh, line of teas. Um, introducing Asian tea properly, uh, but <laughs> and uh, speaking of military service, then yes, did you serve? I did, uh, but we in Taiwan we have a sort of alternative system, mm. which is called substitutive military service, civil service. Yes, yeah. so basically, like uh, because of my major in Arabic and international politics. So I was kind of entitled to apply for uh, substitutive military service, mm. and that's why, like, during my service, I was working in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Taiwan instead oh, of like, you know, joining the army mm. or navy. Yeah, that's actually making better use of your your um, expertise, expertise and talent. Exactly. Yeah, which I think it's lacking in in Korea. Oh, really? You have like I had a 
there was a PhD student that came uh, and served as an infantry marine. Actually, oftentimes what you would find is a lot of the conscripted soldiers and marines and salesmen and uh, sailors and all that airmen uh, have more um, maybe academic uh, background, background or even professional background than the officers. Oh. Very interesting. Because would you, if you were... And in my case, too, for example, I was 26 when I, I you know, just finished my service and I mm. joined when I was 25 or 26, the Marines. Um, I could either do a uh, year and a half, 18 months in the Marine Corps. I see. Or I could do like dedicate maybe four years almost in the, as an officer. Huh. You know, then most of the time, if you have things going on in your life, whether it's uh, you're studying or you're working, you want to get the national service part out of your way, then you will choose for the shortest I length see. service available to you. So but that's tougher, right? The, of course. Um, yeah. And the Marine Corps, obviously, I would say in terms of the the kind of sort of regular conscripted kind of service would be the toughest thing you can go for. Um, and that's why I went for it. Uh, but civil service, we have civil service as well, but it's only for those who are not mentally or physically fit enough to go active duty. I see. But that it's also very, you have a lot of athletes that do civil service, you know. Mm. Um, so it's a bit, uh, that that is also quite blurred. But the issue I have with civil service, civil service is that you are forcing men who aren't, who are, who aren't mentally and physically fit to do two years of mandatory service of some kind. Mm. And so you're forcing them to, you know, be a ticket person, ticket boy at the train stop or like, right. you know, uh, they have. So I think the bougie, one of the bougiest things you could do as a civil servant, conscripted civil servant yeah. is like working in a museum, for example. Right. But, but it's random, I think. So you could be also working at, uh, at a train station and, and be like mopping the floor or, you know, things like that. And hey. that I have a problem with that because why would you force two years of someone's life who isn't clearly capable of doing military conscription? Yeah. Like why? And they're not even, and they're not even well paid. I mean, yeah. they're not paid. I mean, they are paid, but they're not, they're paid in the same level. They would, you'd be paid as a conscripted person, which is, below minimum wage by far. And the thing with a conscripted, also military conscription is that uh, we are paid severely under minimum wage, but also it, what it doesn't take into account is we're working 24 hours, seven days a week. True. <laughs> you know, so we are really severely underpaid. Um, that's why I feel like if we can have a stronger professional military and try to incentivize people to go that path, then, yeah. then the better, because then it's actually an honorable, uh, you know, decision you're making for yourself to be in the military and things like that. As to if everyone is just serving and, um, you know, they all have bad experience with it, then oh, yeah. it's not going to help the military uh, progress, make pro uh, make progress. What is the experience like for you? What was your experience like in the doing that service? And do you know to an ex uh, mm -hmm. you know from from just uh, as a Taiwanese person, obviously didn't do the same kind of military conscription, but what what is the view of military conscription in Taiwan by the Taiwanese people? I think it was, it's kind of divided. Like I knew a couple of years ago, the Taiwanese government did try, you know, uh, they tried to sort of abandon or gradually abandon the, the, the policy of military conscription, but it didn't work out. <laughs> Yeah. I think it didn't work out, and not to mention that we have that kind of sort of imminent uh, threat, maybe from the, our neighbors. So we we do need like some we do need keep that military conscription in place. Um, yeah, it's one year right now. I think it's one year. I suppose it's one year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one year, maybe longer, a bit longer. Um, yeah, it got caught. Uh, down to maybe four months or five months yeah. when they try to sort of, you know, switch the policy, but it didn't work out. I think there was a because well, you need for Taiwanese military, you need active duty personnel. 
mm. to actually man the stations and bases. You yes. don't just need, you know, boot camps and people who haven't gone through basic military training. Yeah. So it takes a while, you yeah. know, to train, uh, like just ordinary people. Yeah. Because there's a, because your active duty personnel in the Taiwanese military, I think most of your resources will be spent on defending the coastlines. Right. Yeah. So you do need personnel, and that's why you need longer conscription. Yeah. Yeah. Even though we have now, we have like high tech, mm -hmm. you know, in modern warfare, that we all yeah. need that. But still, that kind of really basic personnel mm -hmm. need. Is there a geopolitical event right now? Uh, that is of that concerns you the most in Taiwan or like in the world in, in the world or an event that might take place or an event that is taking place there are plenty of events so as a as an academic working in the Middle East I would say like you know what's happening in, in Gaza in mm -hmm. Palestine so and this is really heartbreaking um, I know it's really contentious, you know, to talk about like everywhere to talk about this issue. But I have to say, it's really heartbreaking what's happening now. Yeah. So, but I also know like the Palestinian issue or politics of the Middle East is always the marginalized mm. subject in Taiwan, maybe in East Asia as well. And I think I'm not quite sure if that's for Korea, but in Taiwan and anything anything uh, to do with the Middle East is always uh, understood or shot through a very for me I would say like a very U.S. centric lens. Hmm. So yeah, people do read like international press, media, newspapers, but most of them are reading that or having that kind of information from like the West, not from the local, say the Middle East. So it's really sad. So we only, like most people only get to read like one side of the, the whole story, maybe just kind of ice, just the tip of ice back mm -hmm. of the story. It, it's, it's kind of shame, yeah. I think for me, what worries me the most is, I mean, all the politics and religion and everything aside, is that, If and this goes for you know both sides, uh, if you have a loved one be killed by somebody, mm. um, you will have such a level of a sense of vengeance towards that person, True. and that, and you know, and then that's an entire generation. If it's your parents, probably even worse. Not many people are going to be just, you know, all forgiving and loving and, you know, because you just don't have that surplus, you know, space in the heart mm. for something like that. I mean, why would you also? Uh, so it, to me is the never ending chain of sense of vengeance and revenge that just going to just feed yes. on each other generation all the by time. Generation, yeah. I mean, in South Korea, I think the animosity towards, for example, North Korea, because of the obvious Korean War, mm. and then prior to that, animosity towards the Japanese because of Japanese colonialism, a lot of that is dying out because there is a lack of, um, there's a lack of, uh, because generations have passed, mm. and you don't really have anyone with a first-hand experience in our current generation that have lived through uh, the war, Korean War, or through Japanese colonialism. So you're not as attached to that. You don't have that strong sense of feelings towards the issue. Mm. But but in the Middle East, it's happening ev in every generation. In every generation, exactly, yeah. Especially in Palestine, yeah. I was, I was, and, and obviously it goes same for the for Israel too. But both both ways. Yeah. It's tough. Like um, I, when I was an undergrad, we did discuss 
uh, the Palestinian issue, Palestinian question at that time, that was nearly more than two decades ago. Mm. But still, um, I think we are in a tougher uh, position to talk about this. Um, yeah, it's tough. It, it's it's really heartbreaking. It, it's devast- devastating and uh, to see uh, what's happening on a daily basis. Yeah. Do you have much uh, knowledge about what's happening in uh, Russia and Ukraine? Obviously, that's a little bit outside. No, of your like still in Taiwan, people to talk about uh, the Ukraine war or what Russia has been doing. Because they always uh, there's always kind of analogy, right? Right? Um, like uh, Ukraine for today, Taiwan for tomorrow, that kind of stuff, or, or Hong Kong today, yeah, yeah. tomorrow. So people do do sort of keep on track on that. Okay. Should we take a quick break? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Just a bathroom break. And I can still remember, like, uh, for the first few weeks when I was working in St. Andrews and it was back in January uh, 2019, I can still vividly remember, like, some of these uh, people, all our students, were kind of surprised to see an Asian lecture teaching, like, Mm. not even Taiwan or China, or, like, teaching the Middle East. So many of them were really interested in my background and also the journey I've been through. So I'm always really sort of, you know, lot glad to share. And uh, because like at some point I knew like my presence uh, as an ethnic minority in St. Mm. Andrews uh, is is something, mm. you know. And then I did not realize that until I had that kind of encounter I had that kind of conversation with some of my students. And I remember like I had uh, quite similar conversations with my uh, Asian students, you know, originally from either Singapore and Taiwan. And uh, they they say like, they, they were so excited to see. To see, <laughs> yeah, yeah. To see like you, Asian professors you know, when I went to St. Andrews. When I went to play, well, the, one of the reasons why I got in touch with Tayport the baseball club yeah. is because I saw you oh, really? <laughs> in the photographs on Facebook and YouTube and stuff. And I, I showed it to my father and it's like, oh, he's a good player. I'm like, what do you mean? Look at the way the <laughs> ball kind of falls out of his hands and the spin that he's putting it on. Because he's a, he's a, he's, my family's always played baseball. My grandfather's right. a baseball player. My father, I was very happy to see you when I went. I think well, I bowed to you. you. <laughs> <laughs> That's so like, yeah, really. <laughs> You have you have two kids. What? Yeah, two, two boys. Kids. Two boys. Yeah, were they born here or? Both of them were born here in actually here in Edinburgh. Edinburgh. <laughs> so how was the experience of raising two Taiwanese mm. boys in in Scotland? And do what do you think their yeah. experience is like? And how much of Taiwan or the cultural heritage do you try to teach them? Uh. We we don't sort of intentionally teach them like mm. kind of Taiwanese culture or, or or Taiwanese anything about Taiwan. We I think it's just all around us in life. Mm. So I suppose they are picking up something that everything about Taiwan unconsciously. Yeah, you know, at home we speak uh, Mandarin a bit of Taiwanese, and uh, it's kind of interesting when they play with each other. And they speak like English. So, mm. and at this point, I would say like English is their sort of first language. And but we do we do sort of insist uh, speaking Mandarin or Taiwanese at home. But I know like it. It's kind of interesting when it comes to the discussion of you know teaching a second generation mm. their, their parents' language, right? So they they might be always wondering like why. Because I was born here and I, I go to school here. Why do I need to learn your language? 
right? And there's always kind of rebel from like I have heard so many stories from like my Taiwanese friends and who have kids. They have some kind of the rebel from、uh, their kids. I know some people, some Taiwanese people,、um, would approach that by saying,、uh, even though they are, they were born here, but they are still Taiwanese.、Mm-hmm. Okay, and that is a kind of identity they cannot choose,、mm-hmm. and that is why they need to learn you know, Taiwanese or Mandarin. But for me and my wife, our approach is quite different.、Mm-hmm. And、uh, so, what I said to my kids is that, right? I respect that you speak、uh, English. English is your first language.、Mm-hmm. That's totally fine. But you got to remember, like, not everyone speaks the language you speak.、Mm-hmm. The way to respect people you want to engage with is first to speak their their languages.、Mm-hmm. This is how you show your respect. So the ways in which we we, we teach or, or、uh, encourage them to learn Mandarin or Taiwanese is not because of that kind of nationalistic idea. Yeah, you know, it's not because of their blood.、Mm. Some people would say that it's just to- it's purely because of they need their respect. Like they need to show respect to people who don't speak their languages.、Mm. So this is the approach we take. So so far, it's working okay. <laughs> So、yeah. they go to、uh, they're in primary school now. Yes.、Or? So Cezu, my older son, is、uh, in P six. Okay. And C C Chen and is in P four.、Hmm. Have you gone、P3. back? Have you been to Taiwan with your kids?、Uh, yes. So- We、uh, went back to Taiwan.、Uh, visited my parents and my wife's parents and their family. Uh, in November twenty twenty two, so almost a year, and more than a year. They're just they're fine. Nothing surprises them. Just comes naturally to them. I think so. Yeah.、Uh, and the trip、uh, in November twenty twenty two was the first trip for my second son since he was born.、Mm-hmm. So he had never been to Taiwan since、okay. he was born. So the The trip in back in November 2022 was his first trip to Taiwan, and that was after my wife's my wife's last trip、uh, in 2015. So it was it was a while. That's why the the trip back to Taiwan that time was was quite emotional to every one of us. Yeah,、it、was really emotional.、Mm. How was? How how did how did he react? I mean, what was what was his reaction like when he first got out of the airport and、uh, the humidity? Exactly. <laughs> yes, temperature hot and、uh, like even though it was winter, kind of winter technically winter in Taiwan, but we still put like air conditioning on like、mm. every like <laughs> yeah. So that was a kind of you know、uh, their first reaction to to Taiwan. At the time, but also they really enjoy like everybody else. They、mm. really enjoy food. No, I mean,、um, do you have to? What do you eat at home? Just rice noodles. Yeah, yeah. Normal Asian stuff.、Mm. Yeah, because I cook every day, basically. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Do you ever feel homesick? I would say yes. And I, and especially like after the trip I just mentioned, and that kind of home homesick is getting stronger at some point.、Um, because be, be, before that trip, I was kind of naive, and and thought since my two boys were were born here, and they will be raised here. And、uh, at the time, I I had been I have been here for ten years already, <clears throat> and now I got my degree here. I settled here. I got my job. I, basically, I built up my own family here with my wife, right, with two kids. And I thought before that trip, I thought yeah, Scotland was my home.、Mm. But after that trip, I I just realized how how naive I was. And how many years had it 
how had it been before you went back to Taiwan? Oh,、uh, maybe five, five years. Five years. It was still a long time. Yeah. But the experience five five years ago before then was different. It was different. It was during my PhD,、mm. and so and at that point I thought like it, I might be going back to Taiwan after I finish my degree.、Mm-hmm. But things that did, didn't turn out that way, <laughs>、mm-hmm. so I stayed, and then then I I started working here. So that trip was totally, basically just totally shed shape、uh, the way I sort of think about. And、uh, this was a little bit o- over a year ago. Yeah, twenty twenty two, twenty twenty two. Yeah. Why do you think? Why do you think that is? That now you feel such a. A different kind of sense of homesickness. Because、mm. in doing that trip, we spend quite a lot of time with my my parents, my family, and also my wife's、uh, family. And I realized that that kind of bound, you no, know, we got in Taiwan can now be felt here, cannot、mm. be recreated here. Because that that is a special bond between、uh, grandparents and、uh, you know grandsons, and I, I, we we couldn't find that. We,、mm. we basically we couldn't find that here, and that that is one thing. And the other the other thing is,、uh, it's kind of sad to see like my parents and also my wife's parents getting older,、yeah. gray hairs and and. And it's really sad, you know. And、uh, compared to the year I I went abroad, which is like twelve years ago, so it has changed a lot. Everything has changed a lot. Um. So that's kind of really sad. And sometimes I was said to myself during that trip, and over to, after that trip,、uh, I said to myself, "It was it the right decision to stay here,、hmm. right? Being." Being a son of like Taiwanese parents and being the oldest son in my family, and now we are so far away from Taiwan. Like said, if there was anything that happened, I'm not gonna be with them like immediately. At least it would take like another eighteen hour fly、mm. back to Taiwan, right? So and it got me to think that, well, depending on how we define home. So, but after that trip, I kind of reconceptualize or redefine what I mean by home. But it's kind of tricky because I know、um, I I I I cannot just say like I'm gonna give up my job here. It's which is kind of secure job、mm-hmm. here. You know, in terms of job security. If I quit my job here, then I'm not quite sure if I can find another job in Taiwan because now, like for higher education in Taiwan, it's also really competitive to get a job. Yeah, especially for early career researchers, so it's not easy. So, but wouldn't you have a competitive advantage just because you have such a such a unique sort of background and how you started your career?、Here? Yeah, but like it, it really depends on whether there is a need、uh-huh. for. Or such a kind of scholar having that kind of you know、uh, really unique expertise, right?、Mm-hmm. And as I said earlier, like Taiwan has no like particular interest in politics of the Middle East,、mm. right? It's not like the United Kingdom or like China now or the United States. So, if your family, let's just say that,、mm. so you kind of. You explain the attributes in which define the homesickness you talked about were mainly to do with the the family、yeah. relationship. If your family was here, do you think it, it would be different? It would be different, but we need to hand we need to manage different challenges. Yeah, because my my parents don't speak like English,、mm-hmm. right? So, and a huge part of their life would be so different、mm-hmm. because they don't have friends, they have no social life. And、uh, it's quite tough, yeah, for them. But this is a, this was a kind of dilemma because my mom. I remember like maybe last week, 
last week we had a sort of chat on kind of Taiwanese version. No, no, it's Korean version of WhatsApp line.、Mm. Yeah, we had a chat online, and、uh, she said like she will be visiting us soon, but she is not gonna stay longer、no. than three months. Yeah. Yeah, of course. So not to mention like staying with us for good. Because you said that your your view on Taiwan and home, quote unquote, has changed over the years,、mm-hmm. and you are now here. You've been here for over ten years. Yeah, ten, eleven, twelve, twelve, nearly twelve, nearly twelve.、Uh, I actually have been away from home for. So it's it's complicated because I left Korea when I was twelve, and then I went to Japan, Tokyo.、Uh, But Japan, I feel I feel like I'm at home in Japan. Tokyo is is where I spent my adolescence, where I've gone through probably the most important sort of in the initial building blocks of of my、uh, mm. young my youth.、Um, so I would include Japan as like leaving home, you know. So I would say I left Japan. Tokyo was my home, but I was living in America because I was in a boarding school from fifteen. Yeah,、mm. well, sixteen or around then. Yeah. So, I'm actually just getting into my. I'm just passing like maybe ten year mark now as well. <laughs> right. Yeah, because well, if you take the two years out in which I was in the military in Korea. Yeah, so I'm I'm gonna turn twenty eight this year. So yeah, it's just around twenty ten years. So it's similar. Yes. You know, maybe difference by about two years, and and that is excluding my time in Japan, right? So if I if I said Japan was also my home, which it, which it is, I feel very much at home in Tokyo. Yeah.、Uh, I had a really interesting, eye-opening experience recently in the past couple of years, which I've never imagined would、um, would be the case.、Uh, I had to go back to Korea,、uh, you know, tw- when I was sort of three years ago、mm. for my national service, and then、um, I was in Korea for the longest period of time ever, you know, as as an adult or you know, as someone who left Korea when I was twelve,、uh, living on base and you know,、yeah. interacting with Koreans from all different backgrounds and things like that. And up until that point, I always thought, you know, home is where I make it home, and Because you know Korea、yeah. is just、uh, another place where my family is and things like that. After my service, something changed significantly, and when I came back, it was it was very hard to to adapt to being back. And but I knew that that was going to be the case because I'd been away for so long. My life was very very different, and also there were many challenges that I faced in in my business over the years that made coming back quite bitter. Um, not to worry, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> But,、uh, and that that's when I started to think about, okay, what am I doing here?、Mm. To be honest, yeah.、Um, and a couple of years, a couple so a couple months, incredibly challenging. Probably the most depressed I've felt、mm. in my life. And then, and I overcame all those a lot of challenges that I had to face. And coming back and sort of、uh, recalibrating the business and stuff like this,、uh, and then I went back home for Christmas and New Year. Yeah. And at this point, you know, obviously now we're launching our flagship business is going forward. You know, things are you know looking good.、Um, we've got clear goals for the next couple of years and things like that that I'm confident we'll achieve and go beyond. So, you know, on a good high note, I went back home. Mm. For a little over two weeks, so happy every day, just being with my family, ability, just being able to go and have the delicious Asian foods that I wanted. Yes, and and these foods that I didn't really care much about growing up, like I never eat, ate kimchi growing up. Never ate kimchi growing up.、Really? If somebody wanted to give me kimchi, I'm like, I don't want that. You know.、Oh. And then I left Korea. Then I'm started looking for kimchi a little bit, a、yes. bit by bit, and. Yeah, and、uh, I was so happy when I was in my national service because I was able to eat three meals a day Korean. That was such a joy for me. 
it was it was I came in like there. I have yeah. I had I had the world, and the drill instructors would come and ask like, "How's the food?" You know, because they all know Great. that I've been in in uh, I've been overseas for a while. That I am different from other other uh, regular Korean um, conscripts that were there and all these things. And I told them I love it. And it's like, don't BS me. You know, <laughs> like I really love it. You have no idea what it's like to have Korean broth and rice protein and like two different colorful vegetables every day i loved it you know and then i come back from my recent trip to korea and then i have another withdrawal like pretty bad withdrawal symptoms and once may be an occasion twice like this maybe i need to think about my next you know my my long term yeah, yeah because being back in the east was not an option for me but now it is an it, it is i think necessary mm. that's mm. how i feel and i don't mean this next year or now don't mm. worry you know we're gonna hit the objectives of the business before we go anywhere and again this project also gives me more of a meaning and purpose in being here in the west because mm. this is this project i can only do when i'm living here sure and i'm still young you know so I'd like to think. Mm. Uh, so I guess, yeah, and I don't know why why suddenly that happened. Um, yeah, my family's there, but that was never a problem for me. Uh, was never a problem. I, and I mean, I went to Jap I went to Tokyo after my national service. I I asked myself, what did I what do I want to do after regaining this freedom? Mm. The first thing, and unfortunately, I had to come right back to Scotland because there was an issue with the business, um, and uh, yeah, someone tried to take advantage of the situation. I had to come and remedy it, uh, so I had to come back ASAP. But I wanted to take at least a week to do something I wanted to do because I feel like I've earned it from mm. having been in the Marine Corps and serving through all of that, and then keeping the business going and so forth. And so I went to Tokyo because I said, that's the first thing I want to do. And I haven't been back to Tokyo in five years at that time. The moment I got got off the airport, get on the train, I'm crying. Like <laughs> I had tears in my eyes and everybody looks so normal. And it's just, you know, it's another day for them. But I'm on this train that I used to take, you know, four times a year, three times a year to go to the airport, to go to America, come back home, you know. From Haneda Airport, and the the noise, the vibration of the train, the smell, the the way people act, uh, the body languages, the language uh, itself, like everything, it just made me so emotional. I knew, yeah. And I felt like nobody knew how I felt, but and it's a privilege to be able to feel something so strongly like that being back home. Because you appreciate something a lot more once you've left it, you know? Yeah. Once there is a great distance, then you you realize how, how valuable that is to you. And yes. I feel like at this point in my life, that feels so powerful to me. And I don't know, if I moved, let's say, in five years' time, mm. maybe the experience will be different because you will get used to living there. Mm. And, and every now and then, you will need the reminder of how valuable that is to you by leaving it. Mm. But I feel like that experience was so profound and powerful that I cannot ignore it. No. Yeah. No one, no one can, no one can ignore it because, like, I think that because we talk about like you know home, home. For me, from my experience, it's 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 like you know we we play different roles mm -hmm. in different stages in our life, you know. I think by playing different roles, it, it does give us a different understanding um, in many ways of uh, how we define, how we see home, and also that kind of attachment. And when the flight, you know, the trip we had in uh, November 2022, when the flight, our mm. flight landed in, in the airport in Taoyuan, I cry, I weep. Yeah. I know that is the kind of moment I was looking forward to for, for such a long time. And I I was kind of different in terms of, like, I was no longer a student. Mm -hmm. 
I was I had a proper job. So at some point, like in the sense that I can say to my parents, like, look, I have a job. <laughs> You know, so I'm, I'm no longer the student. So at least there is a, this is kind of achievement, right? Uh, following my PhD,、mm-hmm. so I got a job,、uh, which is kind of decent job in a way. So and I have I I was I'm the father of two boys. So I was different. So that kind of the different roles I play、um, just give me like. You know, different ways of understanding home.、Mm. Yeah, I remember like、uh, our first trip to Taiwan after I came here was 2014, and I remember that on the way back to Scotland, I I still had that have that picture. So my wife holding、uh, Caesar, my older son holding holding Caesar in her arm, and pointing out from. From the cabinet, pointing out that you know we are on the we are on the flight, pointing out that what she said to Caesar is like, "Look, Edinburgh,、hmm. we are home."、Mm-hmm. And from that moment, I realized that yes, we are building up our own family in Edinburgh. Edinburgh should be our home, and I had that kind of idea for many years、mm-hmm. until our last trip. So, yeah, we we you know we play different roles, we learn different. Uh, sort of meaning of home in, in different stages in our life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm even thinking、uh, when I came back、uh, this time around, just a few weeks ago. If I'm gonna have this much a hard time going home and then coming back,、uh, then maybe I shouldn't. I shouldn't go until I have accomplished the objectives that I that I want to accomplish,、mm. which I think I can in the next couple of years or three years, let's say. Maybe I need to not spend that much time and to re-indulge myself in in the sense of being home <laughs> and just be there long enough, short enough, where I don't get used to the jet lag and I, I come back just all kind of half broken <laughs> just because of jet lag <laughs> and I was just dreaming. Yeah, I I even think to that far because the withdrawal is so tough. I and know. And、uh, so I said to my wife that on the way back、uh, to Scotland, I said to to my wife that the longer we stay in Taiwan, the further back we were thrown back to、mm. time. Yeah. The longer we stay, the more we thought about. Oh yeah, that's us. Before we left Taiwan, so it's really tough that kind of withdrawal <laughs> syndrome. So my question is, if you have that kind of strong withdrawal, and some people don't have that, they don't.、Mm. Uh, what? Why is it worth staying here and and continuing to pursue something?、Mm. Obviously, if you have a clear objective, that's that's important. Yeah.、Um, so then, what is that objective for you? And is there a clicking point where you may consider going back to Taiwan、mm-hmm. with your family? So, I literally had that conversation with my with your wife, wife a couple of days ago. Maybe you should bring me in. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the I wouldn't mind the delicious Taiwanese meal, a home cooked meal. I mean, I'm saying, I'm just saying, Xin Yan. Yeah. <laughs> yes.、Um, So I think now, again, now I mean it speaks different roles I play now, right? You know, having different considerations in terms of why I wanted to or why I have to stay here. I think I love my job,、mm-hmm. uh, teaching in St Andrews. I love my students. I love my colleagues. Um, my colleagues, like, people around me, are really nice. Are really supportive. And so I love that kind of collegiality, the kind of vibe working in School of International Relations in St Andrews. So I love my job, and our students are brilliant,、mm. <laughs> just like you. <laughs>、um, so St Andrews students are brilliant. So it, it's a such a privilege to teach,、um, to engage with their learning process, their studies, and.、Um, 
I'm sure, like I, you know, if I try harder, and perhaps I could find a job in Taiwan. But again, like, I'm not quite sure if I would get the same group group of people who are really supportive、yeah. and who who are on the same page in terms of many visions,、mm. in terms of how we should do our job, do our work. And the intellectual the, diversity was exactly so different, and not to mention that kind of as I said earlier, you know,、uh, international relations or politics of the Middle East is is a, such a marginalized subject in Taiwan. So I'm not quite sure if I would get that kind of you know environment or community as I do here. This is one thing, you know, one of the one of the the reasons why I want I want to stay here for now. And the other thing which speaks to the the whole family is kids' education.、Mm. Yeah, I think you 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 did sort of you know cover that in the interview with with Sarah, <laughs> like you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think. I mean, Sarah is she's Korean American and she has a Korean passport too, so that she's both Korean and American. But definitely her.、Uh, Have the experience of her growing up in a country with an educational system where, kind of, it spurs your curiosity, and that definitely helped her. That equipped her better for her to now make the make a choice to wherever she wants to live. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that kids' education is something. I'm not saying that I, I think.、Uh, I'm not saying I think. You know, UK education system or Scottish education system is way much better than what we have in <coughs> Taiwan. I'm not saying that. Yeah. But I think like here,、uh, I can find a sort of a, a comfortable way to raise our kids.、Mm-hmm. Because, or to be honest, I don't want I don't want them to be like doctors or whatever. I just want them to be what they want to be.、Mm. They don't have have to carry. On that kind, of, carry that kind of expect parents' expectation、yeah. or responsibility. I want them to explore themselves, and and I want them to explore what they want to want to do, what they love, what they don't like.、Mm-hmm. So basically, in terms of their career, they just they can choose whatever whatever they want to do. But I don't think that is a kind of the 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 idea. <laughs> Um, in, in Taiwan, in general, like I still, I w- again, I was kind of naive before because when I was a kid,、uh, I was, you know, just like every other Asian kids, we 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 go to school at half seven. By half seven, we got to be there. By half seven, we spend、uh, basically a whole day in school until four in the afternoon.、Mm-hmm. After that, taking a Another hour break, then we go to like Bushi Ban or whatever, which like, is like which is like after school club,、oh, which、no. is for Taiwan has、practice. that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <gasps> I mean, <laughs> how can you be so surprised by no, that? <laughs> but Jap- actually, Japan doesn't have a, as much a Hagwon or bu- Bushi Ban Bushi Ban culture. Yeah, you know, I don't know. But I know Korean does. I think Korea it's does. terrible. Yeah, I think it's, it's it's terrible. I think it's terrible. So we spend like you know basically. Like more than ten hours outside home, and、uh, home eventually just becomes a kind of hotel,、um, which is a shame.、Yeah. So now, like, really, I really appreciate that、uh, my boys、uh, get to choose, well, at least for now. So, what?、Well, let me give you an example、mm-hmm. uh, that kind of speaks to、uh, what I just said. I remember the first day,、uh, my my older son Cesar、uh, went to school, P one, primary one, and the、uh, the first day、uh, he brought back kind of a sheet of A four paper, and on which this the school says like, "Only okay, please, you know,、uh, work on this project with your kid,、uh, in t- about like what you like, what you dislike." What you are good at, what、mm. you are not good at, and I was kind of you no know, frozen. Like I was like, "Did we do this before?" I was asking my wife, "Did we do this <laughs> before?" No, we didn't.、Mm. I mean, in Taiwan, as a kid, we we spent so much time、mm-hmm. to understand what grown ups, what parents' expectation、mm-hmm. is. 
and we spend so much time to explore the world. If we define the world can be approached、mm-hmm. by knowing so many things,、mm. then we spend so much time to catch up to learn like what we were told that、mm. should be known. Right? We spend so much time to explore the world. We did not spend time on exploring ourselves、mm. and then our connection to the world.、Mm. So at the end, like we don't know what we want to do. Mm-hmm. At some point, right, and and it's it was a shock to me. It was shock to me when he brought back that kind of sheet、mm. and the project. And、uh, and ever since then, I was kind of thinking like, yeah, this is exactly what we want our kids to receive the education.、Yeah. Well, if we judge by the result, we don't know yet. Some people might say like. Well, then, what he has learned, what he hasn't learned, does he know how to do something?、Hmm. Perhaps I would say no. But he really enjoys going to going to school. I mean, every day, that there was never a moment when they say like, "I don't want to go to school." But there was me all the time yeah, <laughs> before.、Yeah. I think in primary school in Korea, I was asked a lot about your, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up. Yeah. But they don't ask the questions that help you be, help you think about those baby steps and processes and、yeah. to finding <clears throat> what you actually might want to be. It's not what you want to be is important. Is is the process of getting to that conclusion, which is then being internally curious and curious about the world. And so, yeah, yeah. it was very much just like、mm. conclusion driven. You know. Exactly, it's you can say like it's really like、uh, pragmatic thinking. Like、mm. everything you do now has to be like judged by its result, its outcome, right? Then then、mm. people will say like、hey, you should do this, you should do that, you should be doctor, you should be like lawyers or whatever,、mm. right? Maybe after your I don't know at whatever point it might be. You do move back to East、uh, with your family. Maybe we should start a school <laughs> somewhere in between Korea and Taiwan. <laughs> yeah, but this is something like this is something I, as I just said, I was kind of naive, thinking like they might they might change.、Mm. They might change when I when my generation becomes parents. But I, something I learned from the trip I had we had、uh, in, back in twenty twenty two. Was that well, actually that kind of pressure doesn't go away? That kind of pressure and, and then feeling、uh, is getting stronger、mm-hmm. among my friends who are now parents.、Mm. They are so anxious, you know, in terms of like kids' education, in terms、yeah. of like. And、these are friends in Taiwan, or yeah, yeah. in Taiwan. Yeah. So, and then I realized that this is not a generational thing. This is kind of structural thing,、yeah. right? We 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 are told like, again, like we 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 are told that we have to catch up.、Hmm. We don't we we can't take a break.、Hmm. We need to catch up. We need to catch up to like. You know, certain degree because we have a competitor outside,、mm. we have competitor inside. Yeah, yeah. So that kind of thinking,、uh, it's just. And the reality is, we actually we don't have to catch up anymore, because I mean, we're talking about it institutionally、uh, as an economy society.、Yeah. We don't actually. A lot of the attention is, to, you know, is on us now,、mm. and there's no catch up. That needs to be done anymore. It's now about reevaluating and building our values from our roots, and exactly and assessing the decades of of the fast growth that we've had、mm. and the educational challenges or stuff that we've we've had. It's such an exciting opportunity, and also yeah, the legacy, like、mm. you know, yeah. If、uh, so, so I guess you don't have a clicking point. You don't really, you don't really have a clicking point in mind right now. It's just you're focused on, yeah. You're, you're raising your children in this environment, which has been great. Although we did,、And、we did talk about like、uh, 
if we would like to go back to Taiwan after I am retired, and also like at least like when when my kids are quite independent, so perhaps when they turn twenty or something, they go elsewhere,、uh, get getting married or finding a job, so they they no longer live with with us, and perhaps we can have that kind of option. But for now, I think we will. Still,、uh, stay in Scotland again. I love my job. Great, amazing. Well, I've I've got a friend here、mm. for the long run, <laughs> and、uh, also a teammate for the baseball club. Do you know when the trainings restart? And、um, could be in April. Okay, early April. Okay, yeah. It'll be a little bit more challenging for me to go to the trainings as often because obviously I'm here, <laughs> but I will be、right. present in all the games. And yeah, I also want to make sure I get more of the pitching done right. Then <laughs> yes, let's do <laughs> that. More space. Yeah, let's、spend. do that. Okay. What if you could only have one dish for the rest of your life? What would it be? Oh, right. Such a tough question. It's so easy for me, and I'll explain later. Oh, really?、It's、super simple. It, it takes me like it took me the first time I heard that question. It took me two seconds to respond. Can you just repeat that question again? <laughs> If you could only have one、mm. dish for the rest of your life, what、food. would it be? So mainly, like I, I need to food, food. Yeah. Do we tell you what mine is? Yes, you can. Yeah, Vietnamese beef pho, because it's aromatic. It's got the broth. It's got the protein. It's it's got a type of flavor, aroma, and an experience that will that you will not really get tired of. It's not heavy, but it's also not completely just light. Yeah, it's the beautiful balance of all the the acidity, acidity, the sweetness, the depth.、Ooh. It's it's got everything. I love beef pho. I love、yeah. Vietnamese food. Because I was just gonna say like maybe sticky tofu because I can't sticky tofu because <laughs> I can't find that here. <laughs> okay, I I don't know how to make it here.、Mm. Yeah, but it's like no, like I'm not. Yeah. Okay. So if sticky I sticky tofu, I, no, no, I, no. I, I, I'm gonna change my mind. I, perhaps I would say like hot pot. Okay, hot pot. Yeah, we got spicy、everything. or I、uh, mildly, mildly spicy. Okay, it's fine. Yeah, hot pot because you can put that whatever you like in the hot pot. Noodles. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Fish bowl. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Veggies. It's it's like sliced beef. It's like pho, but you have more selections of things. Exactly, you, you get、there. to choose, and it's constantly boiling, so you can renew、yeah. it. <laughs> Although it's the the soup itself is not healthy. Not, yeah, not healthy. <laughs> I have never been to Taiwan yet, which is crazy. You, sh- you should. I know I should. Yeah, I really should, and definitely not when when I'm in my uniform, which is <laughs> the only time I could probably have went. You know, if I was in the Philippines, but、uh, actually, yeah, like、I、my、should. my my wife went to Seoul、mm. um, uh, maybe ten years ago. Ten years ago, it's yeah, very, very different now. I know it's very different,、yeah. and, and she's learning Korean by herself. I think she's good because she likes、good. K-pop, K drama. <laughs> yes. Basically, I watch like K drama with with her, and we. I mean, she also listened into like K pop,、mm. and、uh, yeah, and I think she's she's quite keen to improve her Korean. I think she can even she can even watch K K drama without subtitle.、Now. Really? Yeah, it's really impressive. That's impressive. And then I I I keep saying to her like. Oh my goodness! Like your Korean is better than my Arabic now. Like I was majoring Arabic now, <laughs> I, it's really rusty. Oh yeah, she's really into that. Yeah. Where's your favorite、uh, country in the Middle East to visit as a tourist? Uh, there's one country I always wanted to visit, which is Oman. Ah. Yeah, because oh yeah, no part of my previous research was about like a kind of. Revolution in Oman in in the mountain area, which is called Dofar, and I was always wanted to visit that country, and because、uh, I was told like it's it's pretty,、mm. kind of natural scenery, a landscape,、yeah. and it's so different from what we see in Dubai, Abu Dhabi,、mm. and other Gulf cities. So I always wanted to go. Yeah. 
this question kind of it goes back to the initial conversation we had about your work mm. um but it's just out of curiosity <laughs> that i wanted to ask you yeah. which is the question says with the shockingly rapid development and usage of artificial general intelligence wow how has this changed or influenced your approach to lectures and academic assignments has that like since agi became a real thing and i'm sure that has changed <laughs> i mean i'm not sure if it made it easier and also come more complicated for you to mm. sort of con conduct papers assignments yeah i th think the easiest answer is challenging it's, it's way more challenging than we thought mm. i mean this kind of ai era um challenging in terms of if let's say if if our students or anybody else want to get something want to learn something mm -hmm. i mean ai is a big help mm -hmm. well, no, for sure they yeah. can get everything through ai they can even learn la foreign languages by themselves they can get every bit of information by themselves Mm, which is kind of challenging. Let's say, like in the case that I have an exam, <laughs> yeah, right, online exam, then like basically, like students who take my exam can put like can put like different prompts in AI mm -hmm. and they'll you know, come out with like different answers or whatever. And it's tough. It's tough for for us uh, when it comes to marking or when when it comes to assessing know how much that they, they actually learn we, mm. we never know like but for me and i think it's also a kind of turning point it's an opportunity for us to think about the meaning of education especially higher education in, in university so what we're going to do mm. so what we can offer yeah you know if we take ai as a yeah. potential competitor right right how would define or, or collaborator i would say collaborator Mm. Yes, but at least like we 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 know we need to find a way to use AI uh, as a collaborative way, mm. not as a competitor, right? So and it got me to think that again, what we, what we what we're gonna teach, mm -hmm. what we're gonna say to our students. So what is worth for them coming to say St Andrews to you know by paying so much tuition, right? Um, What's the point of coming here, right? So for me, I this is something I always share with my students. Like I said to them, like, you guys are here are not collecting information. Your journey being with me or me being your instructor or lecturer with you in this journey of four years, I, I'm not here to help you to do that kind of information collection. Mm. We are here to do some knowledge production, so mm -hmm. we need to differentiate like knowledge and and, and information, <laughs> right? Mm. I mean, AI is powerful. I mean, AI can process everything, mm -hmm. right? But I do believe there is something that cannot be replaced mm -hmm. by AI, yeah. which is, I think, the kind of humanity part. And also the kind of passion about mm. why we need to explore the, the meaning of humanity mm. through university education. This mm -hmm. is something that would not. I'm quite confident that would not be replaced by AI. But the point is that you know this is really kind of an ideal, right? And even kind of utopian idea for some people. But I do think this is our job you know, as university lecturers. We need to think about. Know what we're gonna do, mm -hmm. yeah. But I think the whole idea is that you know yeah. we are doing something about knowledge production instead of information collection. Mm. So in terms of production, knowledge production, there is there is a process. Mm -hmm. We need to take our students through the journey mm -hmm. and let them know uh, why we are here. Yeah. For students mm -hmm. and for those considering a career in academia, especially in international relations, uh, political science, uh, and so forth, 
Do, would you have any advice for them? Um, career advice or any any kind of any advice? kind of advice? If you well, advice <clears throat> that you would have appreciated to hear in your initial, let's say, PhD PhD journey to where、mm. you are to until where you are now. Yeah.、Um, well, my answer could be sort of targeted to any any students who who want to pursue an academic career. Okay, as a PhD students, I think at this point、uh, we have to be realistic in terms of how toxic, maybe how bad the The higher education sector is now. I mean, in the UK, also maybe you know across the world. You know, over the, over the decades, we have produced so many PhD students. But、uh, in terms of job opportunity,、uh, there's not many job opportunities for everybody、mm. who got their PhD. So I would say, for anyone who wants to do a PhD or Uh, I would say, like the first thing they need to ask themselves is why.、Mm-hmm. You know, what is the point of doing PhD at this moment? And、uh, and also, they need to be realistic to to know, like the situation, the job market is no longer like ten years ago, or maybe two, maybe even five years ago. Yes, change a lot.、Mm-hmm. Then the first question I would, if anybody who wants to、uh, come to work with me, perhaps the first question I will always ask is, how much would you like to sacrifice? <laughs> right. Yeah. You you your social life,、hmm. uh, whatever. So how much would you sacrifice? Almost sounds like the questions you have to ask before you start a business. Similar. Exactly. I mean, yes, yes,、yeah. because <laughs> this is not. This is more than just now. How much money you're gonna spend? Also,、mm. how much time you're gonna invest,、mm. right? And、uh, whether whether like not every not everybody、uh, wants to sacrifice their social life、mm-hmm. for doing a PhD. But I would think in this particular moment, I would say you know thinking about that question is is really crucial.、Mm-hmm. Like at least like we we need to we need to face the reality. Yeah. So basically, I don't want to give anyone who wants to do a PhD a rosy image about like once you get a PhD, you will get a lectureship, and or like you know it, your life is is gonna be like、mm-hmm. much better than your PhD. No, it's. It's no longer the case anymore. Yeah, it's really sad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very realistic advice, though.、Great. But at the same time, for those who those people who are doing their PhD, I would say, like you know, don't don't just don't just aim、uh, finding a, an academic job as your your ultimate goal. Like、mm. there are so many things they can do after they got their PhDs, like think tank or, or like private firms or whatever. So yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, pre- yeah. Pleasure. That was re- that was really great. That was amazing. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks. for your time. I wanna fly away, just fly away from here to the place where I.